I'm Mike Waller and I'm welcoming you once more to Britannia Motorcycles. We're going to start a short series of videos which instead of covering a restoration are going to cover the production of one of these trials bikes um, similar to the, the one I ride myself in vintage trials or this is more often the case the one I fall off in vintage trials. It's based on a BSA B25 this was the model which superseded the bike you see behind me, which is one of the C15s, the 250 single cylinder four stroke. There was a 350 version of this, the B40, and a couple of sports versions, the SS80 and 250 guys, and the SS90 for the 350. There was also actually a war department model, which was uh, very popular with the war department, and they kept on buying them and using them for a long time after the actual model production ceased. Um, one of the good things about the WD model is they were designed for dispatch riders and they had an internal set of gear ratios which were much better for off-road use than the standard road bike. But we're not building one of those, we're going to build one of these. And during the course of the videos we're going to go through the frame modifications. This is the oil in frame model, the B25 and we're going to strip the entire top off and replace it with thin wall chrome molly tubing. We're going to change the steering head angle. We're going to shorten the swinging arm to get us to the type of uh, geometry that we want. We're going to put new footrests on. We're going to make this saddle pan, oil tank, new silencer and uh, the fuel tank I'm not sure about. This is off a KT250 the Kawasaki trials bike which I slimmed down a little bit and uh, the second bike I built also had one of these with a much more aesthetically pleasing slim down job. This bike was very much my test machine. Everything I tried on this I used on later bikes. Then when we finished all the framework we're going to move on to the engine and we're going to do a complete rebuild of the engine so you'll see the strip down, the rebuild, change of things like a low compression piston and electronic ignition. Now if anybody sees this rebuild and thinks they'd like to do it themselves, the one thing I would mention is don't buy yourself a nice B25 to convert because you're going to end up throwing away a lot of stuff. All we're going to keep is the frame, the forks and the engine. If you get one of the off-road models or the dual purpose models you're going to get a high level exhaust but other than that that's all you're going to keep. So if you buy a complete bike let's say you're going to throw away wheels, tank, saddle, all the electrics, mud guards, it's hardly worth it. Even with the engine it really would be a good idea to buy an almost scrap one because we're going to change the piston we're probably going to do bearings, we're going to put electronic ignition on it so we're going to throw the alternator away. All in all it's much better to either buy the parts or to get yourself a nice scrap bike but it needs to be cheap. Alright so let's get started. Now before we get into the actual construction work I want to explain one of my pet peeves. This frame and all the places where we have modifications has been bronze welded. Now bronze welding is used on all of the British specials frames. People like Rickman's and all the rest, they used bronze welding. Which here in the US people will insist on calling brazing. Welders do it, the welding supply companies do it, and I've given up arguing the point. So as I say, as it's a pet peeve, I'm going to explain to you the difference between brazing and bronze welding. This is a late 50s BSA C15 frame and it's manufactured in the way that most of the frames at that time were. It was a while before they got to all welded frames like the Norton feather beds and they were nearly all made from a casting like this and then straight tubes. And these tubes are brazed into the casting. Now brazing in this instance is very similar to sweating a joint in plumbing. The casting and the tubes are put together. Sometimes, for instance, in the AGS matchless frames, you'll see a little dimple, and that's where there was a rod put right through. 
to hold the pieces in place, sometimes even laid down on a jig on a half. Then the whole thing is heated up and a brass rod is touched to here and here. And the brass by capillary action, just like solder in plumbing, comes in and makes the joint. Now here you can see that BSA have done it right. They've actually made, if you can follow my finger there, even if you can't see it in the frame, the casting does not have a sharp end to it. It has this nice extension and this makes the joint itself much stronger. It spreads all the forces out. If it was just simply cut off there you would have a shearing force here. Whereas this way it spreads the forces out more into the casting and the tube and makes a much stronger joint. I have in the past with, uh, with some frames had people where they've broken and they want me to just weld it back up, which you can't do because of course the metal at this point is infused with the brass and if you weld it up it'll just break again. The only answer really is to ream it out and put a new piece of tube in and rebraze it. Now I'll show you one other casting on this frame just to show you how much they were used in this particular style of frame building. Now here you can see this really large casting which takes in the frame tube and the mountings for the swinging arm and even the footrest mountings. It's one huge casting. If you want to see some really big castings look at an AMC that is AGS or matchless frame from the period and this rear casting here where the swinging arm mounts is enormous and of course it's heavy. But everywhere you look on this here, here, in other places on the frame if they needed something it was a casting which was sweated onto the tubing. This frame is brazed. Now here on the frame of the trials bike we have a junction where there are actually three tubes one here, one under the seat pan and one here coming to a turned piece which is the mounting of this simply a piece of solid uh, three quarter inch round. These have been bronze welded to that piece of three quarter inch round and it is an extremely strong joint. In fact the manufacturers of chrome molly tubing which in the UK used to be the famous Reynolds 531 recommend you use bronze welding because it is better for the tube. Now I'm going to show you a couple of diagrams and I'll explain why it's better for the tube. Then I promise we'll actually get on to building the bike. Now what you can see here is a representation of a simple butt joint and two pieces of tube. Now with any form of fusion welding, whether it be gas welding, TIG welding, MIG welding or straight stick welding as it's called here, you're going to melt the two parts of the tube and then add a little bit of extra rod. So you're going to melt here, you're going to melt here a bit to get a good uh, penetration and then you're going to fill in a little bit. And this will produce a strong weld. But what it will also do is concentrate all of the heat here, particularly with the electric forms of welding. You'll get very little heat transfer, so you tend to get a slightly brittle uh, portion of metal around the weld. Gas welding is a little gentler because it takes you a while to get this part molten to uh, make the fusion, so the, the heat tends to spread out a little bit. But even so, you're still melting and changing the physical characteristics of the metal at this point. Now with bronze welding you never actually melt the base metal. You do not melt what you're welding itself so you could argue that it's not really welding in that respect. The heat therefore forms quite a gradient in all directions from the weld and then what happens is you actually put the bronze into there and build it up. Now here you can see one of the real pluses with bronze welding. Apart from the fact that the heating procedure is gentler on the tubing, you also get a much larger surface of contact than you do in an ordinary fusion weld. And this allows you to build up fillets. And bronze can do this because of one of its physical properties. With a fusion weld, the filler rod 
is either in one of two st stages. It's either solid or it's molten. There's no in between. With bronze, which is an alloy of copper, rubidium, silicon in various proportions, you get an intermediate stage. So you can start to heat this up just like solder when you touch it it will run where you fluxed in its completely molten form but then by easing the heat off a little bit you can actually begin to build it up it's a semi-solid uh, state where this really comes into its own is with triangulation now whether you're building a motorcycle frame or a Formula One car frame from a strength point of view, you are always trying to triangulate the tubes. It spreads the forces. If you've got a force coming this way, it'll go up here, it'll go down there. Everything is much easier on the structure. You produce far less strictly one-dimensional forces. Now again, if you were welding this, you would weld it and you would get the actual joint just there. But in bronze welding, you can really build these up. You can create a fillet. And now you've got strength in the weld, or in the joint, I should say, all the way here. Even on these sides, you can still build a fillet up. There is one of the great strengths of bronze welding. This really relieves a lot of the stress in that joint. It's not just pulling here, but it's got all of this. It's almost like another form of triangulation on every joint. So there you go. This is bronze welding. If we just simply sweat it into here, that would be brazing. End of my little pet peeve rant. Now let's go and do some work. So now we come to frame choice if we're going to build a 250. The first option was the C15 frame which I showed you when explaining what a brazed frame was and of course the shortcoming with that is that it is brazed so there's very little you can do with it because the whole construction depends on those castings and straight tubes. The next frame they used for the C25 BSA or its Triumph counterpart the TR25W and the B44 which took over from the 350 B40 is this frame here which is based actually on the competition frame and it is you could say 95% all welded. Most of the joints here are welded, the steering head is welded in with some strengthening plates but down here this bottom mounting and the footrest mountings are still casting sweated in. This frame you're going to use if you're going to build a B40 or if you're going to use a B44. But the B40 engine, the 350, was never used by the factory. And in fact, Brian Martin, who was in charge of the competition shop at BSA, said that they tried everything they could to make the B40 work. They even cast different cylinder heads with different sized valves and things. They could never get the 350 to work properly as a trials engine, and consequently always went back to the C15. I have built a bike with one of these recently. Um, I replaced the top and this part as usual and I also slimmed this in a little bit. One thing to bear in mind if you want to use the 350 engine is that the carburetor comes out at an angle and if you use the later frame and really slim it down the carburetor is going to foul here. So just out of interest we'll take this frame and we'll weigh it. We'll use the uh, bathroom scales that I stole from the bathroom so I'll have to keep them clean so the wife doesn't notice. So frame and swinging arm. Thirty-nine pounds. So well, that's our first one. Thirty-nine pounds. I'm actually going to make a note of that for later use. But we aren't going to use this frame, so we will put it out of the way. Next frame is the one that was used for the B25, which superseded the C25. 
and the B50 which superseded the B44. So we went 250, 250, 250 and on the larger sizes they went 350, 441 and then 500. This oil in frame frame, I'll just move the swinging arm here, uses as the name suggests the top tube and the front tube to carry the oil filled in here. Feed to the engine comes out of the bottom, return comes back up to here. And if you want to look at a Yamaha XT500 frame from a few years later, you will see an identical frame. Same sort of geometry, design, and exactly the same for the oil tank. So what we, we have here is, um, as I hope we'll notice when we wait, a lighter frame. But it's still too much for what we want. So what we're going to end up doing is cutting out completely this top tube right out here, all of that gone, and all of this seat loop from there. Then we are going to bend this tube slightly to bring the head round, put in a new top tube, put in new tubes there, slim these in a little bit and shorten them slightly, and then we'll end up with the wheelbase. The one thing that they changed completely with this frame was the way the rear chain tension is maintained. Here it's actually at the swinging arm pivot end. Instead of the wheel moving in the end of the swinging arm, the swinging arm here has a snail cam and you can move it on these pegs to move the whole swinging arm backwards and forwards. It's a little bit of an annoyance because it does mean that the actual pivot point for the swinging arm is a little further back than I would like it to be. If, uh, if we could have it here, we could, and bring the whole back wheel forward, we could get a nice wheelbase and actually allow this to be moved out a little bit and keep the weight more towards the back end. But this is the frame we're going to use. As I said, it was the same one for the 250, the B25, or the T25 and its Triumph guys, and the B50, the 500. And believe me, when the B50 engine is in, the cylinder head is up here, and it's quite a struggle to do things with the motor. So let's weigh this one. Complete with swinging arm again. And it weighs 36.6. So we're actually only gaining a couple of pounds. So, what are we going to do with this? Well, one of the first things you want to know if you're going to build one of these is that these frames are several years old. And they're almost certainly starting to get some stresses within them. You'll notice that for certain when you cut the top off. The frame will tend to just flop open and the engine mountings here won't line up. So we're going to use a jig that I built to hold it at the engine mounting so that we can cut all these pieces off without the mountings changing. So at least when you finish the frame, the engine's going to go in. If you don't want to go to the trouble of a jig, what I did with the very first one was I actually just made up a piece to bolt from here to the engine plates across there so it held the bottom part of the frame in exactly the right position then I could do all the other things. So let's move this out of the way and bring the jig in. So here's the jig I built. You can see here the uh, three engine mountings, the frame will just sit on here, front engine, bottom engine, rear engine mounting. This contraption here is the actual angle that I want to bend the front down tube. And the way we'll do that is when the frame is sitting in there, we will put the front forks in as you'll see. Then this piece here will be clamped into the bottom of the front forks. The front down tube will be heated 
and then this will be turned to pull the forks and the whole thing will swing around until we get where we want and that will hold everything while we do the other the other fabrication the rear part here as you'll see as we use it is to mount the top mountings for the rear suspension units and the mudguard now because we're doing away with the rear part and because there's a cross tube in the bottom of the frame the first thing we're going to have to do is to take one of these frames cut the cross member out the bottom and cut this piece out of there so it will go onto the jig so let me go and change my nice clean clothes put some working clothes on we'll mount the frame up in the jig and we will start on the actual fabrication 